Thank you very much. And I think I can say Father Archer for blessing us as usual with a clear, potent message in song. Thank you, my friend and pastor, for your warm and gracious welcome and introduction. Good evening, everyone. It is good to be in a familiar place and to see some familiar faces, to share the word with which we are all familiar. It's a joy to be here with you. Uh, it rained. I am told you're not accustomed to rain on this side. Uh, but I am from a place where they would tell you it rained cats and dogs sometimes and all the other animals in between there. And it would seem as if that uh, some of the folk are like the ones I have at home. Uh, we call them uh, dry weather something or another. Uh, when it rains, uh, they don't show up, you see. You know, r remind me of this young fellow pastor who was courting and he was telling his girlfriend how much he loved her. And uh, in writing, he would, of course, express his love in polished rhetoric. And uh, part of the letter would say, I love you so much, I'd swim the widest ocean just to be in your presence. I would run through fire barefooted just to be by your side. And then your lover, John, P.S., I'll see you tomorrow if there's no rain. <laughs> well, I hope that I'll see you tomorrow whether there's rain or sunshine. But for this evening, I'd like to say welcome to everyone. It's a joy always to be in God's presence. and We don't take it for granted. I have lived long enough to know that we never know when would be our last encounter in the sanctuary. We sometimes take these things for granted until it is said, oh, he was here just last night and he looked so healthy. He was supposed to be here to preach tomorrow. Huh? Life is fragile. But we praise God for every moment that we have. But it's good that you have an international weekend, so at least I could get to see my sister. I don't see her very often. And I know if I call her name, uh, she would cut my throat. But uh, it's always a joy to see Sylvie. I didn't call her name. I'm just saying it's a joy to see. Uh, uh, did I say anything? Uh, I see a not-so-loving look on her face, but... Uh, it's always a joy to be here with you. Would you bow your heads with me as we talk to our Father, loving Father in heaven. For this privilege of being in your house, in your presence, just to hear your voice, just to share together our songs of praise, Lift our hearts in songs of gratitude to you for your goodness to us. We thank you. We thank you that your word is still potent. We thank you, God, that through your word you bring encouragement to discouraged hearts. You bring hope to those who are despondent. Through your word you bring salvation and so we pray once again that you would bless the ministry of your spoken word to every heart may your name be praised may our hearts be blessed we ask in jesus name i would share with you from the passage that was read to us paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. The first letter, the 22nd and 23rd verses. For the Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. 
For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ, Him crucified. If you are familiar with the map on which you would notice this narrow piece of land called Corinth. The north and south parts of Greece was connected by this narrow neck of land only four miles at its widest point. Corinth, the city rebuilt by Caesar in 46 BC. Corinth, a place of pride and luxury for Caesar wanting to bestow honor on those generals that have served Rome for long periods would settle them down in Corinth. Corinth was a place where you could find almost anything that was luxurious. Corinth was literally the New York City, the melting pot, the connecting place where dwellers of almost every nation would at some point or other pass through Corinth. You could find expensive stuff known to them, Sicilian goat hair, Lyconian wool, Phrygian powder. You could find rare stuff in Corinth. If you are British bred, then Corinth was the Piccadilly Circus in its heyday. Corinth was the downtown Kingston in its prime. Corinth was a place where luxury and pleasure, fame and fortune would set up residence. Corinth was the kind of place where you have a temple at the peak on the hill dedicated to the Greek goddess Aphroditus. The strange thing about this temple is that it had 1,000 priests who were prostitutes. In the daytime, they'd be in the temple, but in the evening, they would descend on the city to ply their priestly trade. This place called Corinth was the home of Greek intelligentsia. Corinth, if you please, was uh, could well be described as the postmodern place for its time. Greek wisdom nestled in Corinth. Jewish pride and place was there joining hands together. Paul came to Corinth, and if you are familiar with the book of Acts, you will discover he spent the longest time in Corinth, 18 months in this place where the ugly head of sin was easily noticed. Paul then in addressing the issues in Corinth said the Jews require a sign. The Jews ought to know who Jesus was. But like the rest of us, sometimes we are so caught up in the stuff around us trying to make a living that we forget how to live. Sometimes we are so deeply entrenched in the things we're trying to get to know that we forget the good stuff that we already knew. The Jews requested a sign. They wanted some significant sign that would somehow tell them that Jesus is God's answer to human problems. The Jews had the writings of the fathers. They had all the prophecies, but they require a sign. Sometimes God literally has to stand upside down just to get us to look right side up. 
the regular ordinary stuff can't get our attention anymore. Even in the way we sin, we don't sin. Well, ordinary sin doesn't seem to be sin anymore. We've got to find new and innovative ways to sin. The fellow gave his mother 21 stab wounds even though one could have killed her based on the autopsy. But he had to give her 21. Why did he kill her? She had the money and he wanted some crack. And his mother said no. And he had to make sure that he would teach her a lesson. It's his mother. Ordinary sin and ordinary death does not appeal to us anymore. The Jews require a sign. Eyes will never see when mind would wish for them to be blind. You see, God will never go out of his way to acquaint us again with the stuff he has already made us aware of. Ellen White says, if men will not believe the book of God, let them study the history of nations. Let them see what God did to men and nations who failed to follow the plain thus saith the Lord God. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom. Greeks are known for their intellectual capacity. As a matter of fact, Corinth was the bedrock of debates. Intellectual giants would meet battling over stuff. Intellectual giants would, would meet to, to reason out stuff, to find answers. But Paul came and he discovered that brilliant persons were doing stupid stuff. Intellectual giants were doing senseless stuff. And Paul would have us understand that no matter how intellectually sufficient we would tell ourselves that we are, you and I, we do not have the wisdom to live our lives independently of the living God. Hear me, honey. Hear me, mister. You can burn down the temple. You can burn up the Bibles. You can shoot the preacher, but you can't live without God. You may flex your fist in the very face of God. You may clench your fist in God's face like Beethoven on his deathbed with all his musical genius died with a clenched fist because he discovered there was something that's missing. Yes, I have come to your pulpit this evening just to make one simple announcement. We do not have the wisdom, nor the wealth to be independent of the living God. We do not have the wisdom, nor the wealth to be independent of God. Here is Paul in the midst of a place where pleasure and luxury walked hand in hand. In the midst of a place where the world's brilliant minds would meet. But as she looked around in 18 months, he discovered wisdom can solve human problems. He discovered wealth can't give the answer that aching hearts desire. He discovered that you may dance the night away, but your pleasure is short-lived. Your laughter is punctuated with sorrow. Paul discover there's something about us that can't be satisfied with the fine garments with which we adorn ourselves. There's something about humanity 
that cannot be satisfied with the food we eat and the fine stuff we ingest. There's something about us that can't be satisfied with the amount of wealth we muster and the strength we have. So Paul said the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ. We preach Jesus as the only solution to the sin problem. We preach him as the only answer to man's questions. We preach him. He is preachable. In the midst of wealth and luxury, Jesus is preachable. In the midst of sophisticated wisdom, we preach him, for he is preachable. In the midst of a place where wealth and luxury, pleasure and teardrops and laughter join hands together. In the midst of a place where you climb the ladder of intellectual ascendancy only to make the sad discovery that what you have achieved can satisfy. We preach Jesus. He's the answer to human predicament. We preach Jesus. Paul said, I was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, but I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for he is the only power that can enable wretched sinners to climb above the pitfalls of sin. I've been blessed with the awesome responsibility of sitting among many who enjoy the wealth of the world. I have been blessed with the awesome responsibility of sitting among those who boast intellectual supremacy. But I have learned that the pain of divorce the issue of cancer, be it cervical cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. I have learned that a man may have more assets than his accountant can fully grasp. But when he comes down to kiss a dying pillow, not one red cent can buy him the health he so madly and badly needs. We preach Christ. In the midst of a world where nothing is permanent, we preach Christ. In the midst of a world where those charged with power can't seem to bring about a peaceful society, we preach Christ. I still chuckle at the fact that your government is quarreling about its debt. And yet in 16 days, trying to find an answer shuts down your, your own system at the cost of $25 billion. You're quarreling about the debt and you racked up $25 billion just quarreling. We don't have the wisdom to manage our world without God. We don't have the wisdom to manage our lives without him the youngster an intellectual genius sat the Caribbean exam that is across our Caribbean eye and unlike many others he got nine distinctions and one credit and he got so upset with himself that he never got ten credits he took his father's license nine millimeter pistol put it in his temple pulled the trigger and ended his own life nine distinctions and one credit the Greeks seek for wisdom but we preach Christ we preach Christ hear me in this Friday evening Vesper service. He is preachable. From Africa to America, he is preachable. From Bombay to Barbados, he is preachable. From the black of us and the white of us, 
he is preachable. From the short like you to the tall like me, he is preachable. He is the only solution to all our problems. He is preachable. Paul, whose name was Saul, stood there at the stoning of Stephen. He heard unbelieving Jews challenging the young deacon and Stephen beginning from Genesis would reel out the prophetic timepiece and he got down from Genesis down to the birth of Jesus and he looked at unbelieving Jews and said you have killed the only answer to your problem and Paul stood there as a Jew himself, hostile to the Christian gospel. But he took note that this one believer in Jesus, even in the midst of being stoned to death, harbored no anger. But with his last dying breath, he said, Father, lay not the sin to their charge. Only Jesus can help you die in dignity and still have a forgiving spirit. We preach Jesus. I was called to the hospital, didn't know the lady, but she summoned me to the ninth floor. Now, I don't know about your hospital, but the ninth floor of the regional hospital, when you get to the ninth floor, you are in the departing lounge your ticket is stamped already you are waiting to board the flight on your way out of here I walked in her private cubicle the nurse pumped her up with morphine cancer was doing its final bit didn't know her name and so I walked in trying to find out how do I address her she said, sit down, pastor. Those three words took a long time to get out. With every word, there was a pregnant pause. And every pause made breathing laborious and painful. And she said, here's a chair propped up on four pillars. She pulled out a piece of paper. She said, I'm going to tell you all that I have. And she ran down a long list of her earthly assets. Then she said, I'm going to give you the names of my three children. And she gave me the three names. And she said, I want you to pray over it and then decide who gets what I said but you can't do that I don't know your children she said pastor don't worry I've been watching you for years and since I am not sure that I'll do the right thing in, in making the will and giving them what they should get I thought about it all night and that's why I called for you. I, I'm reasoning with her, but she said, I, as you can see, I don't have a lot of time left. Can you sing my favorite song? And the words didn't come as rapidly, nor did they flow as smoothly. She lifted her hymnal, and she opened up a song. Here's a woman dying from cancer, painful death. The pain was so intense that I began trembling myself and praying a prayer of my own, saying, God, when I come down to my final moments, don't let me suffer like this. But there was no look of sorrow on her face, no bitterness on her brow. She asked me, young people, to sing with her her favorite song, When Peace like a river attendeth my ways when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou has taught me to say it is well it is well with 
my soul, my sin. Oh, the joy of this glorious thought. My, my sin, not in part, but the whole is, is nailed to his cross. And I, I bear them no more. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. When the clouds be rolled back and the scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Her money was not the joy of her heart. The wealth she had was not the one thing now that was meaningful. Not even the children that she loved dearly. The one thing now that was uppermost in her mind was that Jesus Christ, even in the valley and the shadow of death, takes away the fear of death, eases the pain of cancer, and gives the hope that cancer can take away. A peace that death can never rob. Paul said, Jews ask for a sign. Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Jesus. He is preachable. Young people in a rotten, miserable world, he is preachable. He holds us together. When we have more energy than we have sense, Jesus holds us together. In our teenage years, he holds us together. In our young adult years, when life beckons us from a thousand corners, we preach Jesus. Paul said, Greeks, with all their wisdom, couldn't handle life without him and so he would quote to Greek intelligentsia he would quote from Jeremiah 9 23 and 10 23 let not the wise man glory in his wisdom let not the mighty man glory in his might let not the rich man glory in his riches but the man who glories let him glory in this one thing that he knows and he understands the will of the living God. Then he cried out, O Lord, I know it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We don't have the wisdom to order our lives without God. But tonight I tell you, you can pray like David. Order my steps in the word, O God. Tonight, when the world is falling apart, you can say like David in Psalm 127, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Paul said, you can ask for any sign that you want. You can boast about your wisdom, but we preach Jesus. He is preachable. We preach Christ. When we are young, we preach him. We preach Christ in life's golden years. We preach him. When we come down to kiss a dying pillow, the best friend to have is Jesus. In the valley and the shadow of death, the best friend to have is Jesus. Your friends may forsake you. Your husband may leave you. Your wife may leave you. Your health may leave you. Your wealth may leave you. But I know a Jesus who will never, 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 he'll never leave you we preach Christ he's preachable we preach him as the only mediator between God and man I was in the heart of South America Easter in 1996 I watched on that good Friday morning Devout Catholics crawling on the rugged rocks up to the Gothic cathedral on the hill. The camera zoomed in, their bloody ankles, elbows, and knees, 
as they crawl on their hands and knees, crawling up to the sanctuary. Their church taught them that by doing these things and by doing penance and afflicting themselves, they are building up merits to guarantee their salvation. But ah, I said to somebody, if you ever get to know who Jesus is, you will discover you don't have to shed your own blood. You don't have to sacrifice yourself that way. There's only one mediator between God and man. His blood has already been shed and his blood is sufficient. The song says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Paul said, the Jews ask for a sign and the Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Jesus. He's the only savior. He's a sin remover. He's a soul cleanser. He's a body healer. He's a connecting bridge between earth and glory. He connects the sinner one day suspended between earth and heaven with a timber's cross on a place called Calvary fastened by three rusty nails. I heard him cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19 that God at the same time was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself we preach Jesus he welcomes home prodigal sons and daughters so we preach him he takes our shame and he gives to us his glory so we preach him he takes our death and gives to us life so we preach him when we are broken he takes our broken pieces and he puts them back together again so we preach him when you're helpless despondent discouraged despicable almost at the point of death here he comes and if you ask me preacher do you think he can solve my problem well let me call some witnesses to the stand I summon first of all a man who lied in the presence of the Holy God he had the honor of walking with Jesus eating with Jesus sleeping by Jesus but he said I don't know him when they asked him three times, he decided a plain answer is not good enough. So he employed some adjectives, colorful adjectives. And you have to be Jamaican to understand how colorful those adjectives can get. But he said, he could have, in that look, condemned me. He could have, after resurrection, disbanded me. But he sent a message, go tell my disciples and Peter. He owns us. Even when we denied him, Peter said, he is preachable. If you have denied him, Peter says he'll give you another chance. For that's the kind of Jesus who he is. I summon witness number two. You said, Pastor, I've been so broken. I've been so down. I've been so hopeless. Well, here comes witness number two. He's never walked nor worked for a single day in his life. He was now 40 years of age being carried every day there's some folk like that they've been carried by the church they're carried by society they're carried by their children or carried by their parents or carried by their friends here is he
And he said, Preacher, tell them for 40 years my crippled ankles, my never walked feet. After 40 years, a man looked at me and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. That name, preacher, brought strength to my crippled ankle. That name, preacher, put movement in my lame feet. That name, preacher, lifted me up off my sleeping mat. And I went in the temple, leaping and praising God because of the name of Jesus. We preach him. Well, I have time for one last witness. This witness was a friend of the master. This witness was not just dead to understand how dead he was. Four days had passed. His body was in an advanced state of decomposition. Lazarus was not just dead. He was dead to the third power. He was stiff, stone dead. And you can't get any deader than that. But here comes Jesus. And he asked one question. Show me where you laid him. You think he's hopeless. You think he's done for. Could you play for me softly, sir? Jesus, keep me near the cross. You think he is hopeless. You think he is done for. You think he is such a good for nothing. Show me where you laid him. Your wisdom can't help him, but I can. Your wealth can't help him, but I can. Show me where you've laid him. Mary and Martha said, Lord, by this time, he stinks. It's been four days. His body is now in an advanced state of decomposition. You can't resuscitate him. There is no problem when placed in the hands of God. And his wisdom says, this is what I want. There's no problem beyond the answer that God can give. He's in his grave. The stench of death is in the air. But he called him by name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. The thing that is so amazing to me, the Bible said, his legs were tied up. His hands were tied up. He had a napkin around his face. He couldn't see. But when he heard his name, he said, Jesus, I don't have to see where I'm going. You've called my name. But I'm coming, Jesus. Listen to me this evening. The world, in its so-called wisdom, flexes its fist in the face of God. Last summer, 325 young Californians, teenage youngsters, were having an expensive, fantastic summer camp. Do you know who they were? Young atheists. We don't need God. We don't want him. The German intellectual giant, Frederick Nietzsche, 
the dawn of the 20th century when Germany was flexing its intellectual muscles painted a picture that God is dead he wrote a poem to convey the thought the madman the madman walked out in the street screaming I see God I see God and when they asked where might he be he screamed out he's dead don't you know we've killed him we don't need him Nietzsche on his deathbed now his physical strength is gone his intellectual sophistication was powerless huge audience is now no longer by his side his brilliant friends are gone here is this lonely emaciated figure who once flexed his fist in the face of God showing off his wisdom hear him screaming out in his dying moments come back come back my unknown God all the streams of my heart they yearn after you come back come back don't let me die like this you are my only hope and he died screaming the name of the God whom he spent his life rejecting the Greeks seek wisdom but we preach Jesus Christ tonight you hear in these closing moments maybe you used to walk with Jesus but take it from the old man you can't live without him you may dance the night away, but when the music is out and the lights come down and your head come down to touch a restless pillow, there's an aching void on the inside that only Jesus Christ can satisfy. And so we preach him. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you for putting on human flesh to walk our dusty streets, to experience the stuff we contend with. Thank you for tasting death for every man. Thank you, God, that you broke the bands of death asunder. And here we are. Sometimes we feel so invincible, so independent of you, until we come down to kiss a dying pillow. Tonight, Lord, the beginning of this international weekend celebration, we preach Jesus. We preach Jesus as the restorer of the penitent. We preach Jesus, the solution to our sin problem. We preach Jesus, the help of the helpless, the hope of the hopeless, the strength for the weak, courage for the despondent. We preach Jesus. When all our efforts fail, we preach Jesus as the one who never fails. And so, Lord, tonight we ask, you who can read the very thoughts of humanity, we open our minds to you. Because all of us inside this place, we have our own need of you. 
So we ask you in these closing moments, walk by the pews. And if there's somebody who used to walk with you, Jesus, who have lost their hold on you, restore the penitent. Welcome back, prodigal son and daughter. If there's someone here, Jesus, whose body is in need of a miracle, your hand is not too short. Your ears are not too heavy. Your power is not limited. And your grace is still sufficient. So we ask you, according to the faith of that someone, reach down your hand and help them understand there is still a God who is a mighty deliverer. God, if there's someone here tonight facing life's vicious vicissitudes, short on answers, tall on problems, boxed in on every side, who might not feel like praying anymore. Remind them, God, that even when Lazarus was past decomposition, you brought him back to robust life. Tonight we place our lives in your hands, young and old. We place our future in your hands. And we ask for your guidance in these difficult days. We place our homes in your hands. We place in your hands, oh God, even those things that we sometimes can't even put into words. And we ask you to do what only God Almighty can do. And after you would have done it, after you would have fixed it, then help us to know we ought to be thankful to you. Take us home tonight. Watch over us while we sleep. Bring peace to troubled hearts. And God, bring us back to this place because we know you're going to show up tomorrow. Bring us back to this place. We ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. The Jews ask for a sign. The Greeks seek for wisdom, but we preach Christ.